Hello, I am Joaquin van Schoren. Welcome to part three in our lecture on data pre-processing. And in this video, we'll talk about how to apply data transformations and how to build machine learning pipelines. Now, whenever you use any kind of transformation, it's very important to follow what's called a fit-predict paradigm. Right? That means that we fit the transformer on the train data only. Right? Now, what does fitting mean? Um, say, for instance, you have a standard scaling, and fitting basically just means to record the mean and standard deviation so you can do the scaling afterwards. Right? So you look at your training data, based on your training data alone, you compute the mean and standard deviation for every feature, and then you're done fitting, and then you transform, for instance, scale the training data using those learned uh, model parameters. Uh, and then after you scale the train data, then you can train your learning model. Okay. Now at test time, you want to then also transform the test data using the same scaling you've learned on the test data, on the training data. Right. Very important here is that you do not fit the transformer on the test data. So don't compute the means and standard deviations on your test data. Only use the ones that you've seen in your train data. Uh, so after you then transformed or scaled the data in the same exact way as you scale the train data, then you can evaluate the model. Also, obviously, only scale the input features X, not the targets. Okay. Now, um, why is this so important? Well, first of all, if you would fit and transform the whole data set before you split the data into training tests, which is surprisingly common, which you can do. Your algorithm won't give a peep. It, it doesn't know, right? So, um, but if you would do that, it means you have looked at the test data to do the scaling. And that's obviously wrong because in a real world situation, you would not have access to the test data to be able to scale the data. You'd only do that based on the training data. And it means that the evaluations you get, they may be misleading and they're typically optimistic. I mean, they've seen more data, they've seen the test data. They may actually learn something from the test data. Say your test data is like slightly differently scaled you would then have that information at train time, which you're not allowed to. So your models may actually perform better than if you would not do that. So that's why you should only fit on the train data and then transform the training and test data afterwards. Another mistake is that you fit and transform the training and test data separately, right? So you fit and transform the train data, and then you, again, fit and transform on the test data, right? So you, you, it means that you compute the mean and the maximum on the, the mean and standard deviation on the test data alone. Right? That will cause distortion. Uh, it means that the, 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 train, the training and test points relatively to each other will be different. They'll, they're scaled differently. And we'll, we'll look at an example about that in a minute. Um, so first, how do we do this in scikit-learn? Uh, first of all, there's a bunch of uh, scalers and transformers. In general, they're called transformers. They are in a pre-processing package. And they first of all, they have a fit function. So you can fit on a train data. And then in this case, of course, it will learn the, the mean and standard deviation for every feature. And afterwards, you can then transform the train data using the scaler and then you let the scalar transform test data. And then you get the scaled train data and the scaled test data. That's it. Right? That's how you use this. Uh, there are some shorthands. Um, so what you can do is you can call fit and transform in a chain. Right? So first you fit the scalar, and then you use a scalar to transform. Or this is, this is even better. This is fit transform. It's the same thing as here. Only it's a bit more efficient because, uh, yeah, internally there's some optimizations. Now it's totally fine after you do fit transform to then say x test scaled equals scalar dot transform 
fixed test. Because you have still only fitted the scalar on the train data. So this is just a shorthand for this and this. And then you would also fit it to your uh, scale, and you can then use that scale to transform your test data as well. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at these two um, bad examples. So say for instance, I have this data set here. I have the training set in blue. I have the test set in red. And you can already see the test data has a slightly different distribution. Right? So especially in this feature here, uh, it only has data in this area. So it, has, it's, it operates on a different scale. If you do scaling correctly, you would compute the mean. Right? So for this feature, the mean would be somewhere here. And the mean is actually somewhere here. And you would scale the data. So the, the data points don't move relatively to each other. The only thing that changes is the scale. Like here it was minus 5 to 10, here's 0 and 1. And again, here it's 0 and 1. So you only scale the data, and relatively to each other, the points are more or less the same position. However, if you would compute the mean and differently for training and test set, it means this will be the mean for your training set. And the mean of your test set will be somewhere here. And yeah, somewhere here for the, for the red points, right? So look, looking at only the red points, the mean will be somewhere here in, in this direction, and in this direction, the mean will be somewhere here. That's different from that we saw on the train data. And if we then scale the data, we see that this data is now squashed in the same area between 0 and 1. This is, uh, by the way, this is the min-max scaling between 0 and 1. And that's really bad now, right? Because originally, for instance, this point was close to these two points. But now, because of the bad scaling, this point is suddenly close to this point, no longer to these points, right? So the, the relationship between the test points and the training points has completely been distorted, right? So that's why you should never fit the scalars on the test data. Less obviously often, but also very dangerous, is data leakage. And this often happens whenever you do cross-validation. Say you have some high parameter that you want to tune. Uh, you have no better way to do this than using cross-validation, right? So you you build multiple train test splits. You try so okay. So you build. You, you have first of all, you have your separate test set, always. Then on your training set, you split that again into a training and validation fold, and you may do this n times for n fold cross validation, and then every time um, you fit some model on the training data and you test on test data, you can do this for different high parameters, right? So you can have uh, or different C and gamma values. Uh, multiple times, and then you, you do this multiple times, uh, and then you see what the score is, right? Now, what if we add scaling? If you're not careful, um, you may scale your entire training set before you do the cross-validation. Right? And that's, that's, of course, bad because you have looked at your validation faults. So while you are selecting the optimal high parameters, for instance, here, you're using information from the validation fold that you should not have access to. It also means that um, you have fitted your uh, models here on badly scaled data. And if you would then later on refit your SVM on the entire data set, this is fine now, right? And then you would want to predict on the test set, this test set did not have the same benefit of the information that the validation fault had. So there's an asymmetry here. Um, so that means that, the, the, well, the best models that you found here may not be the best models here. Now to avoid it, what you should do is, of course, only um, scale the data after you split. Right? So first, well, first you have the, the outer train test split. And then for each cross validation fault, we first build the faults and then we fit the scalars on each individual training fault. And then you're good, and then um, you will get good predictions, good evaluations. 
Okay, now this this can get complicated, right? Because you have to well, you have to split your data, split it again, and then for every split, you have to then scale every correlation fold. So that that gets quite tedious. So to avoid that, we can use something called a pipeline. A pipeline is simply a combination of transformation, uh, and then at the end, a learning technique. For instance, it can have two transformers and then a classifier at the end. And a pipeline uh, behaves just as any classifier. Right? It has fit, it has predict, it has a score function. So it will just act as if this was one giant classifier that does internal uh, data transformations. And it will make sure that all transformations are applied correctly. So if you would, for instance, call fit on this pipeline, right? you want to fit on this data, this means that we first have to transform the data on the data X that we're given. So first of all, we fit our first uh, trans uh, transformer T. So we fit that. After we fit, we transform the data, so we get X1. Then we fit our second transformer. We transform X1 into X2. And then on X2, we fit our classifier, and then we're done with fitting. Right. So it didn't only fit our classifier, it also fit all the transformers. Now at predict time, so you have a test set X accent, we would only transform the test data. We, we're not fitting anymore, we're only transforming on the test data. Then we apply the second transformation and then we apply the classifier again. So this is correct. Right. And so pipelines makes this very easily makes this very easy uh, in practice so okay say we have this pipeline here uh, we have a scalar and then a linear svm uh, you can you can do this in different ways so the easiest way is just use make pipeline and you just give a number of steps uh, these steps can be anything uh, except that only the last one can be a classifier you can have a pipeline of multiple transformers. You can have, you can even have a pipeline of only transformers, but you cannot have multiple classifiers. It's only a classifier at the end. Okay, uh, this is the easiest way. Uh, in this case, um, these pipelines will have steps, and the steps will be the name of the class in underscore. So this step will be called minmax scalar. This step will be called linear SVC. Uh, if you want to give your own names, you can use a pipeline constructor and you can, uh, for instance, call this a scalar, you can call this a sphere. It's the same pipeline, you just have given names to the steps. Otherwise, it's exactly identical. Okay, then you can uh, fit and score. So we fit a pipeline. So this will internally do the transformations and train the classifier. And then we can score and test it. Yeah. Um, and this test data here under the hood will also be transformed. So you, the classifier can give the accurate predictions. Right. So it's super simple. You don't have to th even think about the transformations. They will just be executed while you do fit, while you do score correctly. Okay. Uh, if afterwards you want to get your SVM back, you can use main steps and you can get the operate the step or the operation uh, from the pipeline with the main SVM. You can even use this for cross validation. So if you have uh, you want to do a tenfold or fivefold cross validation, you can just use cross valve score with a pipe instead of classifier, and this will work at the shine. Now sometimes you may want to apply different uh, transformations on different features. For instance, if your data set is heterogeneous, which means it has both categorical and numeric features, um, you want to well, you want to do scaling only on numeric features and encoding only on the categorical features. Right. So for that, you can use what's called a column transformer. Uh, first of all, what you do is uh, well. You can either have like a single scaling and a single well, encoder and then combine them, or you can actually have pipelines. So you can have one pipeline for numeric data. So here we impute missing values and then we scale the, the numerical data. And then 
for the categorical pipeline, you first impute the data and then you do what you call it. And then our column transformer will run the categorical pipeline on the list of categorical features which you have to provide. And then you can say the remainder are given to the numeric pipeline. You can also say remainder is passed through, which means the remaining features are just uh, appended to the end without transformation. It's also possible. Or you can have you can have multiple sets of category as well, and you can have multiple of these tuples for the pipeline. You can have multiple pipelines for each set of features. Okay, and then at the end, uh, so this is our pre-processing part. This is only the pre-processing. And then we build our final pipeline, which has the pre-processing going on here. And then at the, at the end, uh, trains an SVM. Okay. Now, another thing you want to do is um, something like this, where you have two pipelines which come together into one pipeline. This is, for instance, useful when you have, for instance, um, some feature construction going on. So you have one pipeline which builds uh, a PCA representation of your data, and another part that adds the best original features. Right? So it means PCA, this will be your PCA features. And then to that, you append the KBS features. So you'll end up with a new data set, uh, which is basically the, the concatenation of the union of the features of every component of this union. Yeah. And you can also safely use pipelines to, to do model selection. Uh, say we want to, uh, uh, well, uh, tune our SVM. Um, as usual, but now we also want to preprocess the data. So we build a pipeline, which has the preprocessing. And then basically nothing changes. We can uh, build a grid of C and gamma and then you can run the grid search um, over this pipeline. The only thing that changes is that now the, the grid search needs to know where this um, hyperparameter belongs to. And so for that, we need to change the name. And we use this notation, the name of the step, dunder, double underscore, and then the name of the hyperparameter. Right. So that's the only thing that changes. And now grid search knows uh, which high parameter to change, it will then internally uh, correctly um, do the trend test bits, do the transformations correctly, uh, give you and then give you the best estimator at the end. Uh, you can also just score directly. So, right, so you can just run a good search on the pipeline using your grid, you fit on train data, and then you score on the test data, and this will automatically score the best estimator for And what happens if you have multiple high parameters for multiple components of the pipeline? So say, for instance, we have uh, a scaling step, a polynomial step. This adds polynomial features up to a certain degree, like we've seen, for instance, in the electron kernels. And then rich. All right, so here we have uh, three steps, the scalar, polynomial, and rich. Now, rich has the alpha parameter. Regular, the regularizer, and polynomial has degree. This defines which degree of polynomials to add. And you want to optimize both. Uh, we can totally do that. Uh, we just have to say that degree belongs to polynomial features, alpha belongs to rich. We do grid search again, and then we can actually look at the entire grid, and we see that we get the best performance if your alpha is 10 and degree is two. If degree is too large, it was an overfitting here, if it's too small, it's underfitting here. 